Greetings, this is JC. I am going to be creating a video to explain each of the different pre-gen characters that I have created for our Castles and Crusades campaign, uh, where we will be playing through Barrow Maze Complete. Okay, so I've created 12 characters that have been basically designed by myself in order to sort of give you an array of each of the different um, archetypes and classes in the system. We have different warriors, different priests, uh, rogues, and wizards. Um, and as a reminder, uh, you can make your own character if you want to read through the rule set, or if you play one of these guys and you decide you want to make your own after a few sessions, uh, or uh, speak to me one-on-one, -on -one, uh, ping me in the Discord in order to help you make your own character. But um, otherwise, uh, just simply selecting one of these 12 characters will probably be more expedient if you're interested in just uh, picking up and playing. Uh, but yeah, so without further ado, let's get into each of the characters. Uh, so we have uh, Backup Gobblers. He is a uh, goblin assassin. Uh, so the... I'm going to go through the character sheets, basically just sort of explaining the decisions and the um, style of play, and hopefully this will kind of jumpstart some of the people's knowledge of the rule set. Um, and yeah, so I'll just get into it. He's a goblin, he's small, uh, he's an assassin, basically he's good at attacking things. His uh, prime ability scores are uh, intelligence and dexterity for those attributes, and then the remaining four are his secondary ones. Basically, those are important for rolling abilities and uh, what you have to roll um, in order to make a success. You have to roll a much harder difficulty against for the blue ones versus the red ones. Um, he has a pretty good armor class, 14, very low hit points. All the characters have very low hit points. There's a few of them with uh, double digits, but um, yeah. So this is a Heads up and a reminder if you um, haven't read the actual uh, documentation in my Discord. I'm using the roll method 5 from the Game uh, Keeper's Guide, which is basically you get 66 points. So uh, in order to evenly distribute wh wh however you wish on your um, attribute scores. So most of these should add to 66. Some of the races give more of a negative than a positive for the, like the plus one strength or a negative one wisdom, for example. So the math doesn't exactly work out for some of them. Um, and I think that's more of a balancing issue that kind of comes into consideration with uh, Roland, for example. So anyway, uh, on this tab here, this is probably the most important tab in Castles and Crusades. And basically this is the uh, calculation tab. Uh, unlike the 5th edition in Fantasy Grounds module rule set for um, the system, Castles and Crusades is a little bit more manual automation. So I've had to actually manually type in these numbers, for example. If you go to your inventory, you can actually show with this icon, you can just click through these, that uh, this is equip. And it'll add and subtract some things, like uh, down here, for example, because the dagger is equipped. But, uh, for example, the armor it doesn't automatically show here. And one of the reasons why is because the system's modularity is a little bit too much. It's similar to, like, Advanced Sons and Dragons, which the rule set is kind of based off of. So in order to sort of keep track of all the different modifiers, it'd be a little difficult. Uh, for example, if you have a shield, some of the characters you'll notice um, here, that I put a notice and special bonuses. I'll just open up uh, Grug for a second. I've put a plus one AC for the shield versus two targets. So basically on the map, you select two targets and you get a shield bonus to them. So I haven't actually calculated that shield bonus in here because it's not applicable to everything. And because a lot of the things in uh, the game system aren't actually applicable to everything, that's one of the reasons why you have to kind of manually type this out. Um, so in cases where it's like kind of three quarters always applicable, for example, the size modifier is almost always applicable because everything you should be fighting is likely high or modern, but there's just a little small note here that you get a negative one AC if it's all creatures and we can kind of just um, work with that as we move along. So yeah, it's just one thing to consider that like as you level and then um, I'll, I'll definitely be helping with this because of people's knowledge of the rule set and this is new to everybody. But 
um, as you get your base attack bonuses and stuff like that, and then some miscellaneous bonuses, or even like a weapon specialization, you kind of have to like open up the actual item and then add your um, uh, to hit modifier here and your damage modifier here if it's applicable um, manually. And then I would just like put in the notes here. So that's kind of like how it kind of works. And I just kind of wanted to go through and sort of explain that because um, you might have a, a, a bonus that is a plus one to your one short bow, for example, but it's not applicable to all bows. So it, it doesn't actually really granularly um, calculate that, and that's why uh, the manual entry is sort of required. Um, it's a little bit uh, cumbersome, but once you actually have it set up, it should be fairly easy because... Um, it, it, once you do, you can just kind of click on uh, this, for example, to make your attack. I guess I should have attacked with like a, a dagger, and then if you uh, hit, then you would just roll your damage, so um, and so forth. This is assuming you have the right um, targets selected in the combat tracker and everything, or on the map or whatever. Um, so yeah, so just keep that in mind that if you equip like better armor that you find in the dungeon, that this will stay as a plus two because if you look at the actual uh, leather armor, its calculation for the AC bonus is two, but that is actually a hard coded entry. So a uh, chain shirt, for example, is a plus four, and you'd have to just modify that to plus four, and then everything will just uh, calculate and overwrite. So I just click on that, click escape to um, deselect, and you'll notice that it's. Um, uh, basically, uh, let me just change that back before, before I forget. Um, change that back. Um, the other interesting thing is um, I'm going to be using weapon speed, and I haven't fully decided how I'm going to do this, but um, I think I'm just going to be basing it off of your equip weapon because I'm going to be using individual weapon speed. Uh, and so I, I just really like the idea of weapon speed, and it's just something that we're going to do. So um, as a reminder, if you look at your item, for example, then the um, encumbrance value is the weapon speed. So what you could do is you could just add in that manually and then roll for your initiative, and then there you go, you uh, rolled a, uh, a two. Although, although it should be a negative, whoops. It should be a negative one because um, it's making you slower and the higher number are better. So make sure that you do it correctly. So here we go. We roll. It's 10 minus one. That's nine. You go on nine for your initiative. And then if you switch your weapons, you just kind of like do it on the fly. Um, it's probably the easiest way to do it. Or you could just uh, roll this and then um, go ahead and then, oh, sorry. You can go like that and then roll your thing if you know what the actual modifier is. If it changes a lot, I'm not sure if that'll really matter, but just keep that in mind. Um, each of the different classes have different abilities. I've tried to get rid of the duplicates where they get the same ability from the uh, race and the class. Um, they are the same. And if you see it on your character sheet, you can remove it. But this will explain basically everything that the character can do. You will get more of these as you level. And you just have to basically open up the actual uh, class and then manually add it on. Uh, so, for example, here we have the assassin. So if I click over on the assassin and on other... Okay, well, they're not going to gain any others. That's one thing that's different about the... Um, uh, first edition kind of rules versus um, some of the other rule sets. Uh, Barbarian probably has something. Yeah, so like the Barbarian gets a whirlwind attack at level four. Um, some classes do gain other things at higher levels. Other classes don't. Uh, it's just kind of, you sort of are able to do more of the things as your character right away because it's assumed that you're more of a... Um, uh, knowledgeable and uh, like an expert so to speak um, but not necessarily a grandmaster with what you can do and this is kind of just uh, explaining uh, these are the different things that you can do and so um, yeah you can make your rolls by just selecting these and then it shows you the modifiers on here as well and whenever you're making these rolls these kind of like correlates to the red and the blue is the uh, primary is red and secondary is blue uh, for your um, attribute scores. And so whenever you're just basically, if you need to do a disguise check, you could just go ahead and roll this. Um, and there's no skills in this rule set, as in like of uh, third edition skills or uh, uh, Pathfinder or something like that. And they work basically 
like they used to were before non-weapon proficiencies existed. And basically, if you did something um, in the rule book, and I'll probably make a write-up or a video about this, but basically, each of the different global things that you can do, it's kind of assumed that you can at least always try it, no matter who you are. And it's based off of an actual um, attribute score. So it might be something that's uh, related to your intelligence. So you could just roll the attribute score here. It's kind of similar to, and see, it'll actually show you it's your prime, and then um, it'll uh, show it through. In the player view, you should have a dice tower. Um, if I switch over to the play, um it's not enabled so dice tower is on okay well i'll try and figure that out later but if you roll into the dice tower i believe what that does is it hides it from you so that you don't necessarily know you're successful if i ask you to do that basically just know that you have to um select and roll into the dice tower um and then that's kind of how you do that um okay so moving on um inventory so the system uses encumbrance, um, and encumbrance is pretty brutal in this edition. Um, and yeah, we're just going to have to play around it. So each thing has an EV value, basically. It really simplifies it for you. And there is kind of burdened and overburdened. And burdened, just as an FYI, gives you a negative 10 to your movement. That's why I, like almost all the characters in here have a negative 10 to their movement score. And the reason why is because they're burdened. And... As you equip more items, or, or at least have them on you, then um, uh, th then you become um, more burdened. And again, th this is a manual entry. It didn't actually calculate that for me um, because a, a lot of this is going to be manual. So um, I've given everybody realistic starting equipment based off of a parcel that I created, and um, which was starting equipment, and I sort of modified it to the actual class itself. And so everybody kind of has that basic sort of covering equipment. The only thing that they don't have is rations. And the other thing that I also did was, um, so you're going to start in a town, and if you think that you want them because you don't think you're going to be back in a day, then um, you can buy your own. And everyone, no matter what their class is, uh, is going to be starting with 80 gold. So um, I'm just doing this kind of for easeability's sake. And basically, there is a role that you get to to do in Castles and Crusades that's similar to AD&D or 3rd um, Edition and so on, where you roll for your actual gold and then you can buy from there. But I didn't really want people rolling from their gold. And um, <clears throat> usually, I, like sometimes I just give out max gold if you're curious. Um, but I just kind of wanted everybody to sort of be on the same starting page. So I gave everybody their basic equipment, some armor if it was applicable, and like one or two weapons, depending on what it was. And then some people have shovels or 10-foot poles or pythons and rope and torches and stuff like that and everybody everybody has basic clothes and all these things add to the encumbrance score based on the ev value uh if the encumbrance uh uh, total encumbrance is lower than the encumbrance rating, you are not burdened. You're basically of a normal encumbrance value, and it doesn't affect your movement or anything like that. Um, and there's uh, an, uh, rules for, like, um, uh, burdened and overburdened, which I might get into into a different video, but just understand that that's what this is. Now, if you don't want the penalty of um, not wanting the movement penalty, for example, which is kind of like the most... Um, uh, direct sort of encumbrance thing, in, in my opinion. Um, you can sort of unequip some of these things. Um, I would say making yourself naked is probably a little bit cheating, but you can do it if you want, I guess. But like, let's say the, the rope is an encumbrance value of three. And if I click through here and go not carried, it, it, it modified it. You notice it actually um, adds it in. And so I, I know in fifth edition and um, uh, 2E, in the past, what I've done is you can drop your backpack and then you won't necessarily be encumbered and that doesn't affect your um, movement values and stuff like that so that you're normal. And and you can do that too here. So what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to make the EV values of anything that's in your backpack a zero and then change your backpack to the newly calculated EV value. And then what you can do is before battle starts, uh, you can just switch it to um, not carried, um, you can get rid of this thing so that it's uh, n your normal value and then kind of go with that. But then you're going to have to remember to um, uh, pick back the uh, backpack up and equip it so that it's actually um, on you. And um, I'm going to go through the 
character sheets and sort of sort of do that so that you just understand why maybe the backpack um, EV value is so high. So that's kind of how I'm going to um, calculate that. Anyway. Uh, moving on. So this is where the inventory um, will get calculated. And this will be really important, especially with becoming overburdened, because as you get into the barrel maze and get more equipment and so on, you'll become more and more encumbered. And you're going to have to choose between whether or not you, um, and this is kind of like an element of uh, choice that I sort of want the players to have. It's like, okay, well, if, if you play Diablo, for example, you only have so many spell um, item slots. Um, with little squares, and you can only carry so much equipment. Well, because you can only carry so much equipment, you can only really bring back so much loot, and if you leave the loot there, as I've mentioned in the notes, it might disappear, because stuff inside the dungeon has picked it up, or other parties that um, are going to be walking around and stuff like that. So, you're going to have to pick and choose what you want and be able to come back. And if you want to bring back everything that you have um, basically found, you might have to hire some hirelings and you're going to have to figure out how to pay for those, how to actually get them to keep their loyalty up so that they don't run away with your stuff or backstab you or kill you or, or whatever have you um, from uh, the, the town of Helix. And um, yeah, just um, have them around, protect them, feed them. Um, keep them happy and such so on and that's just something that you're going to have to consider um, as a side note hirelings will also be important for perhaps like maybe doing excavations and stuff like that um, I've never really um, used hirelings in the past in all too much detail um, other than kind of like basically using them as ads to fill in parts of a party where you feel like you need a couple more tanks to like maybe um, uh, fill in the gaps. But th these hirelings are, are really going to be truly like the, the core hirelings that, uh, that you sort of read in the rule book. And, and if you want to excavate a certain area or something like that and you want it to be done faster, then you might have to hire some. Or if you want to bring back a whole bunch of more loot and stuff like that, you might have to keep them around with you and protect it and so on. And um, yeah, so just something to consider and let's move on. So um, backup doesn't have any um, spells, but there is a spell slot here. And uh, as you level up, you just basically put in these things. I'll get into the spells whenever I get into a different thing, but that's where this is stored. And then the notes basically is where your language are listed. I um, determined which languages these characters have. Um, the rule system seems to give the character player to characters a lot of languages and I just kind of picked and choose from them to seem what I what I deemed would be a little bit more realistic and it lists like their alignment and their size and their the gender and stuff like that and then in some of the characters they have notes here and if you want to flush some of this out a little bit more um, you're more than free to do so uh, I like this notes section especially for like writing down some notes for some of my um, abilities just so that I can um, quickly like reference why some of the math was done in here if I added in some modifiers in a certain item or something like that, like weapon um, proficiency, for example, I, I, I like to make a little note here just so that I know that it's in here, but this kind of just like um, signifies um, uh, as a, a mental note for myself as why I did it in the combat. So that's kind of like the explanation of the first character in the character sheet. I, I spent quite a bit of time with this first character. I'm not going to go into as much detail with every single character because um, it, it's not necessarily needed, but it's just um, um, the different things on the character sheet, sort of how it works and what to consider. So let's move on to the other 11 characters and um, go through them. And the next character we have is Dame Olfin. So she's an elf mist, which is kind of like in this world, it's uh, kind of like a, a, a good version of a drow. Um, it's kind of like the like a, a moonlight uh, elf, so to speak. And so she is our paladin. And uh, there's like the assassin and the paladin probably don't mix. I don't really overly care about that. Uh, I, I care about people playing the game with the dungeons and stuff like that. So um, she has some pretty good strength and then um, charisma because that's basically what... Um, like her her class is sort of based off of yeah yeah wisdom as well but i i kind of um dump sided the wisdom a little bit um just to be able to um the this primary requisite of the class and um 
so basically, she has 10 hit points. She has some pretty good armor. Uh, basically, if you could carry armor by default, you got a uh, chain shirt, which is an AC of 4. And some of the characters have shields. If they have shields, again, not calculated in here, although on here it actually says versus two targets. So we're going to be um, uh, figuring out um, an easy way to um, do that on the actual battle mat. Uh, anyway, so yeah, she has a mace and... Uh, these different abilities that you can read through. Um, basically, the difference between paladins and paladins in, a, I'm going to just call them the modern editions, which is like 3.0 onwards, uh, paladins don't cast spells. They have abilities that are sort of divine-like, and they have fighter abilities. And that's sort of what a paladin is in, um, uh, in the sense of... Um, the castles and crusades it's very much like the original like ad and d paladin um yeah and so like you can uh get weapon training and stuff like that and you have um lay on hands for example and some other abilities and yeah so you can read through um those for more information uh this is her equipment she has some basic equipment she's a little bit stronger so she has a little bit more um stuff like she's carrying a shovel and a pickaxe which is going to be important um more robust armor and stuff like that and your basic items um, doesn't gain spells, as I said, and uh, speaks some array of different languages, and um, she's a medium-sized creature. And she has weapon training mace. So that's based off of the ability, as I um, kind of alluded to before. And so what I did was I added a plus one to the uh, attack modifier here in order so it calculates correctly on the mace. If you get any other maces, you're going to have to do the same thing. And you might be wondering, well, um, don't I get plus one attack and plus one damage? No, you do not. So in uh, older editions of Dungeons and Dragons, basically a lot of the different abilities um, state that you get um, a plus one um, to use the weapon, and that means a plus one like while wielding, as it's worded right here. Uh, and what what that means is essentially it's a plus one to attack. I, I, I looked this up to confirm. It is the way that the older editions work, and it'll actually specify specifically to damage using the weapon uh, if you do actually get uh, a, a bonus of damage. That is a, a perk of the fighter, which we'll get into um, next. Um, so that, that's kind of her perks. And... Um, her uh, character overview and um some of some of them have um special senses um you, you'll notice like some of them have listed like enhanced hearing or they have dark vision um I, I tried to fill this out if some of them are missing definitely add it but they're basically based off of um what's listed here if you have different visions and stuff like that because these will become uh extremely important with different checks uh like uh, the listen checks will be um, important for uh perception checks and things like that um, okay, so let's go on to our resident fighter, Grug. And so what Grug is, is pretty much he's your typical fighter. Uh, so he is a half-orc, and he has prime uh, attributes of strength and dexterity. Uh, he is, um, orcs are um, very good against uh, diseases, and he has a medium shield and um, uh, can defend better against two different targets. Uh, he has, um, 10 hit points and, um, yeah, so pretty good armor class and studio's dexterity modifier. He uses a bearded axe. This is a really cool weapon and it's really, really brutal. Um, and, uh, yeah, 3d4 plus three. That's crazy. Um, so this is his main, uh, weapon. It is a little bit slower though. Uh, so that's going to take into consideration, but it's the, da the damage is what's worth it. And if you don't like the weapon that I gave you, uh, and you want this character, for example, and you want to choose a different weapon that's around the same, um, type, as long as it's not magical, obviously, uh, speak with me and yeah, we can change it. it it's entirely up to you. So, um, the fighter starts with a two hit bonus of one based off of their, um, two hit modifier which is basically the um, parallel for um, what Thaco works. If you know the Thaco brackets and how they work, they're the exact same for the different um, archetypes of classes in, uh, in the... Th and in, in this game, um, so he, he he doesn't have very many abilities. Although uh, one thing to note is that um, if you go to the classes and to fighter for the player's handbook, um, the 
he he does get combat dominance and an extra attack eventually and i do fully expect that this will go up to uh double digit levels i don't know how long we'll play this for it might only be like six months or something like that or until people get bored of it and maybe people will find it real exciting we'll can people play it for a very long time um but uh yeah and so if you really want to know what um, the extra ones are for the fighter, um, basically you gain an extra attack at um, this and then some other stuff like a 12th level, you get uh, four attacks and um, you get a third attack uh, somewhere in there. But um, yeah, so you get extra attacks um, basically as a fighter and that's really the perk of being a fighter. You get all these extra attacks. Um, your uh, weapon specialization of the Bearded Axe, it, if you read it uh, of specialization, it gives you a plus one bonus to hit and a plus one bonus to damage, and it increases to plus two at level seven. Uh, so I've chosen uh, uh, the Bearded Axe, as it says a specific weapon, and that's why he has a plus four and a plus three to attack. So uh, Grug can really hit things uh, super hard and super easy, and um, can uh, take a hit too, since of his double hit points and stuff. So he's uh, Truly, uh, a damage dealing um, uh, tank in 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 the fi uh, party, um, and hopefully he'll be able to um, show his um, uh, importance to the party. So, uh, I, I really recommend somebody pick up Grug um, because without a fighter, without dealing the damage, um, you you guys are gonna have a hard time. Um, I mentioned uh, party balance, so you're gonna need one of the rogues. Uh, one of the fighters, one of the uh, priests, and you're going to need uh, one of the wizards. So if somebody doesn't select one of those, I'm going to uh, kindly talk to some people. So uh, there's bards in this. <clears throat> bards are kind of cool. Uh, as in the paladins of the modern editions, uh, bards work in the same way spell-wise. They, they do not gain spells. Um, so that is... Um, well, actually, let, let me confirm that class... Bard. Yeah, they gain um, some. Basically, like this helps you with doing uh, checks on figuring out what things are, whether they're common or uncommon, and then um, y your skill on basically being able to identify them, sort of. So I think that's really cool because you're going to be finding a lot of things that you don't necessarily know about. Um, and yeah, here we gain the ability to basically fascinate creatures and sort of like uh, CC them. And that's paraphrasing these abilities a lot. I haven't even read a lot of these in um, full detail. Um, and this one at ninth level, what you gain is um, you basically, uh, yeah, y you gain the ability to inspire others and they get bonuses to hit and... Um, it gives you um, cool buffing uh, to the class. So that's kind of the bard's uh, realm of expertise. It's sort of a minor fighter. They they count as a rogue, basically, um, <clears throat> in my opinion. Uh, but they're they're kind of like a minor fighter with some roguish abilities and some um, some some neat buff tricks. Uh, so his armor class isn't great. He has leather armor. Uh, he uses a short sword. He has no bonuses to attack and stuff like that. Uh, and he has some pretty cool abilities, um, like uh, identifying items or moving silently. And he has like spell resistance, spotting hitting doors and stuff like that. So this this is one of the rogues of the party, basically. Uh, he he doesn't have like remove traps. And and stuff like that that's sort of the difference between the the rogue and the bard and uh he has your basic inventory he's carrying quite a bit actually he's got like a a, a lot of like he has a 10 foot pole and some rope and your basic equipment and stuff like that so he's got some pretty useful things um he's got quite a few languages to be able to converse with like some goblins and orcs and stuff like that which uh it's kind of cool, and uh, he's a medium size, and this is kind of like what the the bard is sort of like. So uh, this class is uh, really cool. This is sort of a makeshift druid. Actually, I'm gonna read him later and skip him. Um, these are all alphabetical, and um, it's very similar to the druid, but I'll get to him later. But the barbarian is the other fighter that's in the group, and uh, he has basically an awesome constitution and an awesome strength, um, and and. In case you haven't noticed, a uh, 16 plus 2, yeah, the pluses don't work the same as they did in um, uh, D20 systems. They, they work like they do in AD&D, &D minus the uh, uh, percent strength. That, that doesn't exist. But he has 14 hit points, and I think he has the most hit points out of anybody. Um, so he has a D12 for hit points, plus 2 constitution. And he has... Uh, 
uh, he's a dwarf, so he's small, and he, he gains a AC bonus versus all the medium-sized creatures, which I'm, I'm going to be honest, most of the creatures in here are undead, and most of them are medium-sized and larger, so that's going to be a huge advantage. A lot of the characters here actually are a small size, kind of did it on purpose, because I'm like, eh, survivability, you need more AC, this is um, going to help, and I like non-human races, so deal with it. Um, yeah, so... <clears throat> He has a spear and a two-handed sword. He does not use shields. Uh, doesn't feel like he needs them. But uh, he, he doesn't hit for as much damage as the other fighter, but uh, he's got some other versatility in there where he's got some more hit points and stuff like that. Uh, and he has different abilities, like uh, his deep... V uh, deep vision um his combat sense and stuff like that uh he can intimidate stuff and um yeah he has resistance to poisons and to fears which uh, definitely will come up because as you mentioned as i mentioned in the notes that fear is going to be a big thing so he's going to be basically uh, jumping into um areas fearlessly and stuff like that uh and yeah and he has a uh, cool defensive expertise against larger things so uh most of it's going to be undead but if you find uh skeletal ogres or giants uh for example i'm going to make this count uh and he has a combat sense which is pretty cool um so in this surprise attack um Effectiveness with surprise, flank or rear against them. Uh, you get a plus two bonus one uh, rolling a supplies on foes uh, attempting to surprise them. So you can just sort of jump right in there and surprise people, which is kind of like an advantage of the Barbarian. So I'm definitely going to be playing with that. And it works with, um, I think, the sneak attacks too, if I understand the rules correctly. Uh, he's got your basic equipment and stuff like that. He's got a male shirt too. Uh, he's got no shirt though. He's just got his trousers and his male shirt. He doesn't really feel that he... Uh, uh, he's overburdened by that. Barbarians don't get spells, and he's got some languages, and he's chaotic good. And uh, yeah, so this is our dwarven barbarian. He's a dwarf of a, like you notice some of the races have um, this like abbreviation in the brackets. Um, those are races of um, castles and crusades world setting. Uh, they work a little bit differently. So if you click on dwarf in the races, it will be a little bit different. Or if you're using um, the uh, core rulebook, th this dwarf might not be in there. Um, just as a note. So that's uh, uh, Tynar. And uh, Dakon is our first uh, mage class. And he is a hobgoblin wizard. Uh, he is basically highly intelligent and uh, has pretty good constitution. Um, five hit points. He's good at listening. He has basically nothing to him makes a combat. Uh, this is a good opportunity for me to explain how uh, ammunition slings work. Um, so there's no bullet in the um, book, and I didn't really want to add it. So basically what I'm doing is adding rocks. I don't know if this is the proper way to do it as Castle Crusades, but this is the way I'm going to do it. You can throw a rock, which does a D2 worth of damage. Um if you hit, and or you put it in a sling, and a sling does a d4. Um, and I just put, you have 20 rocks in your invent inventory, and then I put the ammo here. So whenever this fills out, and you've used all the 20, you're going to have to go in here and then manually um, change this. And rocks are free. You can basically pick it up. So if you want to renew them, like just be conscious, uh, cognizant about asking me. Uh, and yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll work with thing uh, with that as we move along. Um, but yeah. Uh, so where was I? He's got some cool abilities. Um, he's dark vision, uh, bonus spells, and um, I think this is from the Hobgoblin race. He's got spells and his weapon affinity. Uh, so Hobgoblins deal an additional plus one of damage on a successful strike with any weapon of their choice. Um, so I'm going to add in that with uh, the uh, sling, and he's basically going to uh, get a plus one damage with this. Um, and... Uh, yeah, and then I can add in those notes um, after. So um, that's uh, kind of like what that is. So you can just go copy and then, yeah, what, oh, staff. We're just going to switch this to uh, sling and then go ahead and I just decided on the fly I'm going to switch this to sling because it's probably better. He's not going to be a melee. It's kind of a dumb choice. Okay. Uh, he's got basic inventory. Uh, he has a spell book. Uh, I've added this item. I'm not making it have a EV value, because uh, the other books in the edition don't, but um, if you lose this, you won't be able to really like um, prepare your spells and stuff like that. Uh, spells, so the way that spells work um, is very similar to AD&D, and uh, different than modern editions, and so basically, uh, the amount of spells that you get uh, 
uh, first level um, is equal to the number of spells that you um, can cast. So that would be a total of seven spells. Um, so I didn't have to choose four and three. And so, in fact, some of them I did three and four. Uh, and um, so this is technically four and two, but he gets a bonus spell because of his um, intelligence, and he will be gaining another one at uh, second level. Um, at, at third level, where we've got second level spells. Um, he'll he'll have two here instead of one. Um, and you gotta ma you gotta manually um, change this. So um, if you whenever you level up, and again I will be helping with this, but if this is actually if I level up this character, that I do, this will not dynamically change. Um, but the interesting thing is if you click the mode, you can actually um, have the preparation. And so this is how many many of them that you can prepare. And see, it'll tell you four and three. And this is what this top part is for. So say I want to know identify and then have two sleeps ready uh, and then uh, one of each of these. Um, these are my prepared spells. And if I go to combat, now what this will do is it, it'll actually keep track of like um, some of these are... Um, uh, uh, theater, the th theater of the mind spells. Um, so like, you don't necessarily need to make rolls and stuff like that. Um, but if I were to cast message, for example, um, then uh, and it's a spell slot, it's not infinite. Make sure you understand that because it's different. Um, then I would just basically click on this and it would go away. Um, it's still there if you um, go back over to the preparation, but it, it, there's a check mark on it. And then after, if you rest the character, then it'll, uh, with a long rest, it will actually come back. So you're just going to want to make sure that at the beginning of your day, you're going to want to properly prepare your spells and go over to the combat section so you can keep track of which ones that you've used for your spell slots. And, and that's the, it's really cool, uh, easy way to manage your spells and stuff like that and that's basically with any of the uh, casters uh, it essentially works the same way um, and with the mages every level that you uh, gain you get to choose one spell um, of your choice and that's the way that it works in this edition so whenever you reach level two you can select any um, level zero or level one spell since those are the available types of spells that you have and then eventually whenever three comes up you can choose a uh, level zero one or two spell and then add that to your repertoire um, otherwise it's just uh, writing uh, books down in your um um, scrolls down in your um, spellbook, and in order to do that, you need read magic, um, and then you basically do a ritual and figure out if you um, uh, you, you write those to to your book, and then you, you work it out from there. I'll, I'll go into more details about how to do that in a different video, uh, and then um, yeah, so they have the affinity, some different languages. They are neutral evil. Okay, so let's go over to our ranger, Flemeth. So uh, she is a Wood Elf Ranger, and her prime are Strength and Dexterity, which give her a plus one in each of those. She has 10 hit points. She's really good at listening uh, for those checks. And in her combat, uh, she uses either a longbow or a short sword. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, and yeah, so she has leather armor and a dex mod. That's why her AC is 13. Uh, and so her abilities, she has, rangers have quite a bit of them. She can basically uh, do things with traps and she has weapon training and different wilderness lore, spell resistance due to her elven abilities um, and um, combat abilities and spell resistances. And she has spell like abilities. Um, she can speak with plants. Um, which I think I gotta add there. It's a first level druid spell. And yeah, so has some cool ranger esque abilities, but um like the uh D twenty system, they, they don't cast spells in the same way. Um if you go to the uh classes and then ranger uh other, you will notice that the only spell uh, ability that they gain at higher uh, levels is a favorite enemy. And this is at sixth level, and basically you choose a favorite enemy, um, and you gain bonuses to attack, um, and you get bonuses um, against that favorite enemy and your armor class, uh, and for tracking against them, um, which is kind of a cool ability. Um, so that's what you'll be gaining as a uh, ranger as you go forward. And um, so there, her inventory is your basic stuff and her bow and her sword. Uh, again, no spells. I'll have to add in that one spell there um, so that you can cast it. Um, and then, yeah, weapon training. 
Uh, plus one to uh, to hit uh, for short swords and bows, uh, which is calculated in here. You'll notice this plus one for um, for both of those. And um, oh, technically, this should be here. Oh, uh, here. Okay, and I can probably delete. Whoops. Yeah, there we go. Okay, uh, there we go. So that's done correctly now. Um, so there's that plus one here and here. And she has some languages. She's chaotic good like most rangers uh, who are good lines. And yeah, that's the ranger. Uh, so Larissa is the only base cleric and somebody's going to have to pick her up. Um, and if nobody does, it's going to be a poor party choice. Um, not trying to force people to play certain characters, but... You're going to need healing and turn undead. So just hinting, you can do whatever you want but and make it as difficult as you want. But anyway, she has eight hit points. Uh, she has a medium shield, which gives her plus one AC. So it could be 17. So it's pretty good AC. Uh, and yeah, so her combat abilities are her large mace, uh, which is a uh, D10, which is kind of cool. Uh, and she has a slaying with a bunch of rocks. And yeah. So that's cool. And also, uh, she's a gnome, so she actually gets a AC bonus against medium-sized larger creatures. Uh, so what she can do is uh, she has dark vision, hand searing. She's going to be getting spells. Uh, she can turn undead. That's the important thing. And so um, I have to double check to make sure the rules work for the modifications. Um, I guess your difficulty classes will be what modified. But turning on dead is harder in uh, Barrow Maze. Uh, so whenever you actually make your check, um, this number, um, this uh, difficulty class essentially that you're going to be matching against is going to be a little bit harder. Uh, and she has weapon specialization, um, which I'll get into is... Uh, I don't think I actually selected that for her. It's supposed to be for her mace. Um, so she gained a um, plus one for her mace uh, for attacking. So yeah, um, her inventory, she has quite a bit of inventory because she's a stronger character and can carry a lot more. Um, I guess it's not overly true. She has a nine strength. But anyway, she has a bunch of cool equipment like rope and stuff like that. Probably going to be pretty useful. A pickaxe and pythons and stuff like that. Her mace and stuff. Uh, and then spells. So um, with the way that a cleric works or a priest i should say uh you gain access to each of the different spells uh it's just like first edition and then you can prepare the spells how you want and then they'll show up on the combat tab um so uh three and one for first level she gets a bonus because of her uh wisdom of 15 she doesn't have a 16 uh i wanted to give her some extra hit points uh and a um yeah so the uh or was I? Um, so yeah, so, so these are the spells that she'll have access to, and they're you can read through them if you want more information. Um, yeah, so that's our cleric. So let's go to our druid. So druids are a subclass of uh, priests. They actually have a different spell list. So the uh, they use spheres or schools of um, magic or domains, uh, depending on the edition that you're talking about. In later editions and earlier editions, it was just a spell list that you had access to, and it was different for wizards, illusionists, priests, and uh, druids. And yeah, so their spell list is a little bit different. They have a little bit more hit points because they are a druid. Um, they have a size and index modifier for that armor class. They basically just have a staff and a sling. Uh, they gain... Um, different abilities such as like i think this is due to her being a halfling with the hide and stuff like that um the one thing i don't like about this is not say racial abilities and uh class abilities they're kind of all mixed together uh anyway you, yeah you gain some spells and what do you gain later on in the uh, class if you level them up so if we go to here you will notice that you get resist elements and woodland stride and totem shape so resist elements is just a saving throw against the different elements uh woodland stride is something that allows you to move through uh difficult terrain basically at normal speed um which might not come up because you're going to kind of be in a dungeon but there is some overland that's in a boggy area so could matter uh totem shape um i actually don't know too much about this but basically it allows you to um 
Yeah, it, it cha- it's it's your wild shape ability, essentially, from what I think it is. And then eventually you can assume once per day, Druids gain the ability to shape in a large version of one of the previously chosen totem forms. Um, so, yeah, you have an animal, you can change into it. Um, go into more about that later. But anyway, that's kind of what the Druid is and where it goes into. Um, and they have their basic equipment and stuff like that, and their spell list. Here's a spell list for all of the uh, zero and first level spells. Now, I've added everything in from all the books that I purchased, which is quite a few of them. Um, I have like the different, so a few of the different players' guides to the world setting and the DM, the castle keepers with his game masters, player's handbook, and monster books, and stuff like that. Um, yeah, so that's the first type of druid. Um, the second one, which is the other character that I skipped, which is uh, Ronlin, and he is... Th- this is a race, which is a class, which is a BX um, edition kind of flavor. And so this is essentially a druid, uh, but it's sort of a gnome druid. Uh, so that's why I put the race down as here. So they gain the abilities of sort of the gnome and the druid as well, kind of like as a class. Uh, if you've never played basic Dungeons and Dragons, this might seem a little weird, but they have a couple, four different classes that are like this. Um, and I just kind of wanted to create one of them because I thought they were cool. So uh, this is sort of similar to a druid because they have access to um, uh, the spells and stuff like that as per a uh, druid. Um, and then they have... Uh, like uh, here, you can acquire like natural poisons and antitoxins and stuff like that. Um, you have dark vision, combat expertise versus goblins and things, and animal um, empathy. Uh, that's due to um, the gnomes. Uh, but if I open up the actual class, it seems like I should probably just keep that window up. Uh, here, let me go to other. Assume elemental form. This is the big difference about this class in which I thought made it seem cool. Uh, so instead of being uh, changing to like your totem, what this does is it allows you to assume an elemental form. And what this will be is one of the basic elements of air, fire, water, or earth. And uh, once you choose which one you want, then you choose you you basically act as a four hit dice elemental of um, that at sixth uh, level. And whenever you get to 10th level, it's a seven hit die, 11th level, it's an eight die, 12 is a ninth. So basically you turn into an elemental. And I thought this was really freaking cool. Um, and so I just, I had to put this in here because I thought he was really neat. And yeah, um, he has, uh, moving on, uh, the, um, basic inventory, and then he has the same uh, selections of spells. So um, the the disadvantage of this is this doesn't work out to the exact same numbers, I believe it was. Um, and uh, you had a very... Uh, what was it? Um, Yeah, I think it was some of the proficiencies. Because if you look at the actual classes in clerics and stuff like that, it'll tell you specifically what you're allowed to use and not use. Um, it's a little more stringent in this edition about it. Um, but yeah, you can use any wooden or stone weapon, uh, wood or leather. Uh, you assume the form and uh, you get some stuff with poisons and stuff like that. Um, yeah, it's just really cool. Anyway, let's move on. Enough dwelling on that. Uh, so where were we? Uh, we did uh, Rona, skipped over to Ronlin. So Tem, Tem, she is a halfling rogue. This is basically the generic rogue archetype um, where the uh, Gobbers is an assassin and can kind of like deal some some damages and stuff like that. Uh, she is your traditional uh, rogue archetype. So if you know what a rogue is, you kind of understand what this character is. But anyway, she has yeah, so she has uh, six, seven hit points because of her uh, dexterity. Uh, she's small. She gains bonus to this. She has leather armor, so it's a total of thirteen. She uses a hand crossbow. She has some bolts in there, and she has a dagger. Um. So on top of that, uh, let's see, she's the back attack, she has Thieves Can't, she can do the climbing and decipher scripts, she has Dusk Vision, uh, she's fearless of, um, this is the halfling thing, Fury of the Small, 
Uh, she's listen, move silently, open locks, pick pockets, and uh, she can um, detect and create traps, basically. So you're a traditional thief. She's your basic equipment and uh, doesn't use spells, obviously, um, and has a few languages, and she is small size, neutral, good. Okay, uh, so that's pretty quick. Let's do the last character, which is Winthana. And Winthana is the uh, Twilight Elf. Um, so we have a Mist Elf. Oh, I think I got that wrong. Mist Elves are not the good drow the Twilight Elves are. Um, so she is um, an illusionist. Uh, again, with the Druid list, the illusionist list of spells is different than the wizard's list, so some of the spells um, that you have access to are going to be a little bit different. Uh, and most of these spells are crowd control based, so this is kind of like the wizard that's sort of like a, a buff class and a uh, uh, CCer. Uh, if you play um, traditional uh, computer RPGs, she's like the blue mage of the party, if that makes sense to you. Uh, very little hit points, obviously. Um, that's why I gave her a good constitution. Uh, she uses uh, slings and a staff. Uh, so <clears throat> she gains her bonus spells, um, has the disguise ability. She can move silently. She has different spell resistance. She has her spell list. She, uh, elven spot hidden doors. Um, she has the weapon training. Um, and she has some wilderness lore in there. Her basic inventory is here as follows. Uh, these are the spells that I've given her. Uh, everyone basically got read magic. And then so you'll notice it's like, okay, um, she can create light. This is a temporary charm. That's create an illusion. That's a charm. Uh, this makes people unconscious. This makes a person lose an action. You kind of get the flavor of the character based off of the spells that I've selected. A lot of the spells that are available for the illusionist are very um, thematically um, skewed this way. Um and uh, yeah, so that's sort of our resident illusionist. And that kind of covers all of our 12 characters that are going to be available for our um, uh, Castles and Crusades campaign for the Mega Dungeon uh, Barrel Maze Complete. Uh, I hope this was helpful. Um, I understand that this was about an hour long. We're running at around 52 minutes right now. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions about the characters, uh, don't be afraid to DM me uh, and ask if you want to create your own character. Again, you're more than welcome to. I listed in the Discord uh, all of the um, available races and classes in the game and just uh, DM me so that we can do a one-on-one -on -one session to sort of work through uh, the uh, character builder uh, like so and I'll have one uh, built up for you but um, otherwise I hope you enjoy your day and um, game on.